everyone. Welcome to IT Tech Talk. I'm your host, Joel Ward, and tuning in with me today is Benjamin. Benjamin, how are you doing? Great. How are you doing today, Joel? Uh, good. It's uh, uh, 6 o'clock here, and it's uh, freezing cold, and, and I, as you told me, you're in Florida. Probably pretty warm down there. Uh, not super warm. I think it, 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 hit, uh, it hit the mid-60s today. Okay. Well, still not bad. It's I think it was like when I looked up my dash thing today, it was like 20 degrees, so... It's pretty freezing down here. And actually, uh, two days ago, it was negative nine degrees or something like it was nine degrees or negative nine. I don't know. It's cold. (laughs) It's just cold. Um, I I would much prefer it to be super cold than than the kind of how cold it gets here in Florida. Well, we can uh, always trade. We can always trade. Look, I'd rather the heat, although, you know, like we were just talking, my servers probably wouldn't like the heat like you were just telling me. Probably not. So, Um, (laughs) Benjamin, we got to talk before the show, um, but just give my listeners a brief overview. What do you what do you do? What are your likes? What are your hobbies? What do you do for work? So I, I'm one of those people that uh, is never at rest. So um, I've been in financial services for 10 years, started you know fresh out of college and grad school and whatnot, uh, working for a SaaS company. Uh, we did accounts payable automation. Um, after that, um, I went to work for uh, one of the largest software companies uh, in the world in financial services. Uh, we're one of the largest hedge fund administrators, one of the largest uh, mutual fund transfer agencies. But Generally speaking, the company, you know, we, we, we sell software and services back into investment managers. If you want to be an investment manager and just deal with uh, clients and investing their money, we can handle basically everything else. Uh, and then aside from that, um, I've been kind of a lifelong entrepreneur, started my first venture, you know, selling uh, cucumbers out of, out of my wagon uh, around the neighborhood um, uh, that I grew in my garden. And then, um, you know, I've had a, a, I had a funded uh, company in mobile ordering and payments uh, right out of college. Um, since then, I've worked on all sorts of different stuff from, um, you know, autonomous vehicles to uh, cannabis software to uh, wine, uh, wine profiling. Um, but uh, the last couple of years, I've been focusing on advising, advising startups. I've got a, a small stable of startups that I work with on a on a weekly basis to, um, you know, help them with their early stage strategy needs. So. That's awesome. I, 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 uh, the one thing that interested me the most that was wine profiling. I'm a big wino. So what, what, for my viewers who don't understand what that is, what's wine profiling? Yeah. So, uh, it's actually a technology that we developed for, um, the cannabis industry. Essentially we, we take chemistry data, um, and, and we can visualize it and we, we pump it into uh, an algorithm that we developed to be able to do really high fidelity matching. So if you've had a product that was really fantastic, we'll tell you what's on the market today that, um, is really similar. And uh, we've been working for the last two years on porting that technology to wine. Uh, wine's a lot more complex. You know, enology is a is a constantly evolving subject. You know, cannabis, we got to worry about, you know, 30 to 40 compounds um, uh, in our profiles. And with wine, it's in the hundreds. Um, and just because the way that wine is experienced um, from the user, it, it's, it, it's very different with how, you know, we experience it. You're, you're smelling it. You're tasting it. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but your 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 mouth has just way more taste buds than it's on your tongue. There's taste buds in your throat. There's taste buds buds in your cheeks. Uh, you actually have smell receptors that activate differently on inhale than they do on exhale. Um, that's why you know when you think about when you're tasting wine, you're doing that chewing motion. What you're doing is you're activating, you're aerating, you're aerosolizing the wine so it gets up into the back of your throat and into your nostrils and your sinuses. It's Super complex. So wine is a tough nut to crack. We we, we still haven't figured the the science just uh, out just yet for it. That's really cool, though. I mean, it's still fascinating to me that that that's even exists. And you know, um, I talked about it on the show before, but there, it's just so insane how technology has evolved, and and we're able to, as, as a collective species, evolve our technology to suit our needs better. Like you were just talking about the mobile payments thing, like. I, I pay with my phone literally everywhere at this point. Like I, the other day, I forgot my wallet and I never forget my wallet. It was in my other pants pocket that I was washing and I, I it was in the laundry and I literally was at the grocery. And I was like, oh, I can't, I, I don't have my wallet. I can't pay for the groceries. I was like, I'll be right back. Can you hold these? And she's like, well, we take mobile payments. I was like, saved. Like, so I just tap my phone and, and you know, it's so simple. And um, I stand in line now. I see all these people paying with their phones or tapping their cards. And it's just, it's so insane how, how mobile payments have evolved and you said right out called you had that so can you talk more about that you right out called you had this mobile payment thing could you could you uh, just yeah, give us more information on that so we actually started around the same time that um square and stripe and ziosk and all manner of different companies started up um, we were focused on bars primarily you know we were you know fresh out of you know 
we actually started uh, my last year of, of grad school uh, and raised some money for it. And really similar kind of a thing where we were sitting in a bar and we were struggling trying to get served, uh, you know, kind of having to wade through the, 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 the press of people up at the bar. And we're like, man, I, I'm sitting here. I had my first smartphone. It was, a, it was a, the original Droid. So this was like 2010, I think. And, uh, and I'm sitting there like, I have a, a, a computer in my hand more powerful than what got us to the moon. Why do I have to fight through a bunch of people to put in a drink order? Was, I was yeah, I was so annoyed from it. So we actually sat down and started working on the technology and figuring it out. Um, and at the time, it's it's funny, you know, you could you could launch this company uh, super easily today, but back then, you know, uh, we had to be PCI compliance because we couldn't just use Stripe to process payments. We had to you know integrate with the payment processor very early on in you know internet payment processor days. You know, we were using um. Oh, I don't remember them. They're, they were the biggest one, but now they've, they've surely been eclipsed by a, a Stripe at this point. But you know, we had to we had to build a a cloud based PCI compliance, which is interesting because um, we were working with Rackspace at the time and spent gobs and gobs of money uh, achi- trying to achieve PCI compliance in the cloud, which at the time no one had done it before. Uh, and Rackspace actually, I, I don't know this for sure, but this is always assumed like uh, right after we went out of business, they actually started selling a PCI compliant cloud setup. So I kind of assumed they just sort of copy pasted our our setup for, for other clients down the road. But it, it'd be so much easier to, to, to start up today. And actually, that's one of the startups that I'm I'm advising right now is actually working on that. Uh, shout out to the uh, uh, Cheers uh, team. Um, they're doing the exact same thing, but they're building it from the ground up with better technology uh, it's going to be really fantastic. You know, 2020, 2021 would have been the year for, for my company. We would have made millions and millions of dollars. Um, it's funny cause you know, our whole order flow was based off of uh, QR codes. And at the time QR codes were difficult to work with. It was, it's, it was absolutely the best application for the QR code technology. But the problem was you basically had to download a virus onto your phone because no one really made QR code apps. It wasn't integrated into the camera at the time. Uh, so you had to download another app to scan the QR code to then download our app, which had its own QR scanner in it. But by that time, like you lose people having to go through so many hops. Uh, just was not a great experience. But now there's QR codes everywhere. And it's funny because every time I see a QR code in the wild, I point at it and my wife gets my wife laughs at me because I'm always I'm always a little bit bitter that like we did QR codes, we did payments with QR codes before anyone else did. And uh, had we been smarter, we probably would have patented and probably made a lot more a lot of money these days. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, yeah. QR codes. Like I remember when the pandemic was just gone, and people were like, "Don't give me a menu, just give me a QR code." And I'm just like, mm-hmm. I would sit there and see some of these bars I would go to or restaurants. They didn't do the QR code; it would be huge or something, and your camera couldn't catch it. And it was like, "Can I just please see a menu?" And they're like, "No, you need to scan this." And they're like, "Look, I did it." And I'm like, "Yeah, how did you do that? My camera is not scanning this." So the <laughs> frustration is, is like making those QR codes work. Um, yeah, I know that. Uh, I don't know if you read the or listened to the recent um, article. Uh, where the FBI said there was a lot of QR code scams going on right now. I think it was in Texas where uh, they were using QR codes on meters and people were scanning it and their information was getting stolen. And, and nothing against QR codes. I think they're a great technology. I think they're just something way beyond their their time. Um, but there is a lot of vulnerability. And 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 just even in mobile payments, uh, there's a lot of vulnerability in mobile payments just in, in, in like you said, Stripe, um, Square Pay. There's so many vulnerabilities that we just don't see but but you know the thing that really it's really un- boggles my mind is like we have those vulnerabilities but yet we still use it because we're re- so reliant on it like you know mm-hmm. we need that stuff to s- survive like I, when i check out anymore there's like i think stripe is like it's stripe or um there's a couple ones on amazon there's a couple ones on like uh paypal like you you, you have all these options to pay virtually and it's so insane it's like somebody made money off this idea like of mobile payments. And and I talked about it. Um, I don't know if you listened to it. I know you said you were listening to some episodes, but the one very r- early on the episode, I talked about digital currency. And, and as a whole, digital currency is just all around us. People think it's just cryptocurrencies. Well, digital currencies is you pay with your card, you're paying with digital currency. And, and so insane to think all these transactions are happening it, somewhere in the cloud somewhere on AWS or somewhere. They're happening through through microtransactions and stuff and and it's like somebody came up with that and so you had that idea and and, and it's so insane because you you know you said like if if we had patented it or done something it would have gone somewhere um i'd like to take a step further so you you do a lot of like startups and stuff what 
what is your entrepreneurship goals in life? What do you, what do you really want to do in life? Like, you know, uh, you work with startups and stuff, but what's your goals as like, you know, what do you really want to do that is going to really make you like realize that I'm in the right thing that I'm doing what I want to do. Cause I know you said you, you work for like a company that like, you know, does stuff, but what do you want to do as yourself? Like with startups or like, I know you said you were working with startups. What do you really want to do? Is it, is it the startup thing or do you have something bigger in mind? So I really like working with entrepreneurs directly. That's kind of my, my big passion. Um, you know, I, I I can't stick with things for a super long time before I start getting burnt out on them, especially if things aren't going well. You know, my goal is at some point to have a, a good exit or, or be successful enough in my career where I have the freedom to kind of pursue my own things. Because I've got a book full of ideas of things that I would love to pursue, don't have time to, uh, you know, do it on my own. Um, and don't have the resources either. So I'd love to have the resources and time to just devote to bringing some of, some of my ideas to reality. Uh, but again, like I love working with founders. I think founders are fascinating people. They're, I love the energy. You know, I, I do a ton of meetups uh, here locally, and I actually um, helped run a meetup in St. Louis uh, before we came to Florida um, and just love being around entrepreneurs, love working with them. Um, and I love really the uh, the early stage is kind of my passion. Like I really love early stage strategy. I love uh, financial modeling. I like that, you know, figuring it out phase of, okay, we've got this idea. You know, what's all the stuff that's going to kill us? How do we get around it? Um, you know, I talk to my, um, hopefully you can't hear my kids in the background. Uh, I talk to my I can hear uh, kids. Founders. It's fine. My I can hear mine in the background too. You're fine. <laughs> um uh, I, I talk to my founders and I always tell them, you know, focus on the stuff, you know, you got to prioritize. You always got so much stuff coming at you so fast, especially in those early stages. I'm like, focus on the stuff that's going to kill you in a week, in a month, in a quarter, in a year. And then anything after that doesn't matter. And you're like, it, it, you know, if this will only scale for the next six months, that's okay. You can solve it in six months, um, but it's not going to, it's not going to kill you today. You know, so many entrepreneurs are so focused on building perfect that they actually never get launched. And that was one of the big lessons I learned in my first company is, you know, we spent a lot of uh, time and effort and money trying to build the perfect solution for it. And uh, we could have launched, you know, months and months ahead of time and probably done much better uh, overall had we just gotten the product in, into people's hands. Yeah. And I actually, you know, I started a business prior right before the pandemic and it was in it because i'm an it specialist i i you know i went to school did all this stuff got certified um started my own it company and uh you know was doing great during the pandemic was it was great and then inflation hit real bad and, and with inflation came loss of clients and and then loss of interest and then people weren't calling me and now i've got the sticker on the back of my car and like no one's calling me and, and, you know, someone like you probably could have even given me advice, but it's still like the pandemic hit a lot of my friends' businesses hard. Like the pandemic ruined a lot of lives. It really mm -hmm. totaled a lot of businesses in my area. Like places I really like to visit were shut down because they, people couldn't afford to go or they, they were too scared to go. And it was, and not that I'm saying people were too like scared of people, but it, it really affected people in like a really big way. Like restaurants that were really great in this area are now no longer here. Um, so, you know, I really, you know, I'm listening to you talk about this and it really bothers me because I'm like, I really wanted to run my own IT business. I was really excited. I got all the certifications, you know, and I was so dead set on doing this. I went and, you know, my business, I talked to my business or my parents and my dad, you know, he owns a, uh, a business and, and he's been in business for almost 30 some years. You know, he's in the agricultural industry. Uh, he has his own, he has his own dairy laboratory. You know, he does a lot of great things. I always want to take over, you know, and be in his footsteps and, you know, have my own business. And, and then the pandemic hit and I was like, it really took a toll on me. And I really like took a step back. I'm like, do I really want to keep doing this? And I, I still have my Facebook page. I still offer, you know, people I'm like, you know, but I've been doing a lot of pro bono work. I'm like, look, like people are like, I can't pay you. I'm like, look, I know you're struggling. I know you need to get back to school or I know you need, you have your kids and I know it's, a, it's hard. And, and because I have a full-time job, because I get paid well at my full-time job, I have the ability to give pro bono work. And, and I know that some people are like, why are you doing pro bono work? Like you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're wanting to do things for yourself. I know that. But giving back to my community, and this is the one thing that really sets me apart in this area, is giving back to my community is really more important than getting a dollar for me. Like I have money, I have a house, I have everything's taken care of. I, I know I'm gonna be set. It's taking care of my community around me that really makes me, um, you know, 
and not to brag, but makes me the best entrepreneur, entrepreneur in my area because a lot of the people who are still sucking people dry for money, I'm just trying to help my, my neighbor in need, you know? Uh, and, and, and one of the things that really um, upset me about the pandemic was um, I had all these clients. I had real estate offices. I was working with all these people, and I, I was making good money. I was bringing in stacks of cash, and I couldn't even imagine. I was like, what is going on? Like, I, I just started, and I'm really making it. And, and you know, it, it hit, and I was like, devastated but you know i picked myself back up and this is just my advice i tell people is like i picked myself back up i looked at it and i was like one day i'll build this back one day i'll have it again it may not be tomorrow it may not be next year it may not be the year after it'll happen though and my and i told my dad i said i really i really want to do this and he said keep doing it and he said you know it took me you know it took me four years before i really got what i wanted out of my business he's like you will get it um I'm not trying to get off topic, but you know, this it, it, you know, entrepreneurship runs in my family. My my dad, you know, started his company real young, and and uh, he built a business that's now worldwide, and he's he's well known in the farming community. You know, he's he's really done he's done well for himself, and you know, I work there and I, I help out. And I'm I'm being promoted actually up and upgraded into a where I you know I really belong, and it's great. Um, but it's not what I want to do. But now it's like when I got promoted, I was like he's putting me in these positions because he knows that. One day I'm going to leave there. But for right now, he's just trying to give me experience in the job industry and in business and, and stuff. And it's like, great. Like, I need that. <laughs> so I'm um, sorry. We got a topic there. Um, but no, that's that dude. It's it's just it kind of sad. I was like trying not to cry. I was like thinking, listening to you talk about, you know, startups and entrepreneurship. It's like, great. You know, I love hearing that. Like, I love talking to my guests, but it, bog it bothers me because I like I really want to be my entrepreneurship, get my stuff going again. But, you know. Here we are, 2022, and I, I'm, you know, still trying to get everything back and going again. You know, I'm going back to school for project manager. I'm going to get more classes. You know, I'm doing that stuff um, so I can help more people. But, like, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I, I, I've re got to realize if it's not going to go, you know, if it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. But if it's going to happen, it'll happen. So we'll see. If you want to well, give me thoughts on if you want to give me thoughts <laughs> on that, you're welcome to. I mean, this is what the show is about. Well, I mean, that's a that's it's a great. You had a couple really good points in there. Um, and your dad's advice is really good, is to keep doing it because at the end of the day, so much of of success is timing. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, when I used to when I used to run a, a startup group, um, uh, I, I get really annoyed when entrepreneurs get up there and they talk about how their successes. But we have you know, truly very little hand in our own successes. Um, we can control our failures, but success mm -hmm. is probably 70, 75% timing, 20% luck, 5% us, right? Um, if you look at most of the big success stories, it was they were doing the right thing at the right time. You know what, there's probably 30 or 40 other people that were working on similar things at the same time as well. Like I said, there was tons and tons of companies working alongside us, you know, uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, Stripe and Square and Ziosk were all around, starting around the same time that we did. But there was also probably forty other companies. If you look at, it's, it's actually really interesting. If you look at AngelList, because AngelList was just just coming about back back when we launched, um, there's probably about forty companies that were all working on mobile ordering and payments. Everybody saw smartphone. We can use this to pay for stuff, and everybody went at it. But the people who were lucky were the people who had, you know, previous successes. So you know, Jim McKelvey. Um, part of the Square team, you know, he had some 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 previous successes, and because of that, he had people knew him. You know, your personal brand as an entrepreneur is one of the most important things that you can curate. Um, something I don't personally do as well, which is why I'm starting to try to do podcasts and whatnot. Um, but you know, personal brand is incredibly important um, to build up. So your dad's advice of just keep doing it and, and what you're doing already, you know, doing the pro bono work for now. If you become the guy that's known in your community for doing really solid. Uh, IT work and people know that you're knowledgeable and you keep those skills up to speed. When it comes time for you to relaunch your business, there's going to be people there that you know you've you've put it, you've got your brownie points and you've you've put in your dues and they know that you're worth your salt um, because people who are working with nonprofits and stuff have business of their their own, you know. So doing work with nonprofits is a great way to build up a personal brand uh, as an IT uh, consultant or as an IT person. Um, because the people who contribute and who sit on uh, nonprofit boards, they all have businesses of their own and they all have IT needs. And whether it's for their businesses or maybe for their personal, you know, the, the, the guy that, uh, you know, you were talking with a couple of weeks ago um, was talking about, he does, you know, the, that security service for individuals. It's a fantastic thing to do. There's high net worth people all over the place to have 
very sensitive data that need to be protected. And there's not a lot of people that target individuals, uh, you know, in that realm. That's a huge business opportunity, probably. Yeah, yeah, and I like I like what you touched on personal branding. Uh, I, I'm I thank you for the shout out. Like I've been listening to my show. I'm like I really appreciate you listening. Like it's it's you know I really try hard. That's why I got into the podcasting realm because like you know that was another thing. I was like I want to do this. And I remember um, I don't know if you know who Nick Nallback is, but Nick Nallback got me into the podcasting world. He was like, dude, you should just launch it. Just just go for it. Just try it. And I, and I launched it. You know, and people listen in. They tune in. I'm I, and Spotify apparently told me I'm listened to in 30 countries. So. People are listening to me. <laughs> I mean, United Kingdom listens to me the most. Australia listens to me a lot. Um, I have all these people, you know, listening, and then and 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 my branding is getting. Oh, sorry, my branding is getting better. Um, and people are listening to me and, and understanding who I am, and they're like, "Oh, I listened to your show," or "Oh, I ho- know someone," or like you know, and I'm getting that you know acknowledgement. Um, another thing that personally brand, I actually have a second book, but I don't um I don't know where it is, but I actually wrote a book. Um, no way can see it. I'm holding it up, but it's called <laughs> a Successful Future Isn't Just Written. I wrote it with three great female co-authors. Uh, it's about personal success and gaining personal success because success isn't just money and fame to us. Um, success to me is uh, having a great marriage, having a great family life, um, being good with your kids, um, just growing success throughout uh, your personal life. Not money, not fame, not being not acknowledged. You know, yeah, people listen to my podcast. That's not why I do this. I do it because I want to give people information on other things in the world. Uh, I do my book, uh, my second book. Um, it's, a, it's a more spiritual book. I do it because I wanted people to get knowledge and understanding of what I go through and what I went through and how I overcame it. Um, why I wrote The Successful Future is um, for personal branding reasons was because I wanted people to – Get my understanding of success isn't just money. Success isn't just being a successful YouTuber or or movie star or business owner or CEO. It's about personally having a successful relationship with yourself and understanding that you are your best ally when it comes to success. You are the only person that can make yourself successful and no one else can. It's no one else can give you the money to start success and no one else can make you personally successful. I like, I, you know, I listen to all these people who are like, oh, if you do this, you do that, you become successful. No, it's, it's you. You're the only person you have to kick back and say, hey, what can I do to make myself successful? So I sought out three great female co-authors and, and they are great. Tiffany Hanner, she's a wonderful friend of mine now. Um, Maddie Hunt, she's in Israel doing great work over there with a nonprofit. Um, Charlene Riche, she's a uh, mo- uh, Instagram model. Each one of those people, when I got to know them on my podcast or or just uh, just through professional places, um, we got to talking, and their success stories. When I talked to them, were just well rounded individuals, and I loved it. And if you have a chance to buy it and read it, I I, I highly recommend it. It got some great reviews, six great reviews on Amazon. Uh, so, but. Yeah, I, I, those people and their and their stories and and just hearing them and reading them and then people are reading it and like wow like this is great this is this is what I want to hear and actually my editor um of my second book uh, who read the first book uh, who gave me a review he said that the success one was my starting platform but the second book literally he felt like he was having a conversation in a coffee shop with me and it was just something he needed to read at that point in time he said it was very spiritual for him it was very open for him um he felt uh you know very um open to hearing what i had to say so you know i i have a platform now like I i have this podcast i have you know i do a lot of um pro bono work i do a lot of like outreach with community i do a lot with my church i do a lot so it's like I'm I'm out there. I'm putting myself out there. I'm trying to be a public presence, uh, public, uh, public. You know, I uh, can't think of the word. I'm like blanking for some reason, but I'm trying to get my name recognized. And, and a lot of people in this area know me, and they know who I am, and they know what I've done. They know where I'm going. Uh, and and you know, I share that with you it, to to say like, look, I'm trying. You know, I'm I'm doing the best I can. I'm going to rebrand. I'm rebranded myself so many times and tried so hard. But you know, each time I failed, and I think you can relate to this. Each time I failed, I just got back up, tried something different, and it worked. And it may not have worked for long, but as I get more and more skills, I learn more about myself as a person and what I need to find to settle into the niche that is my I um entrepreneurship success story. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's, it's really cliche. People talk about, uh, you know, there's no such thing as failure as long as you learn something. Um, and I never really bought into that. Um, 
until I started advising, uh, until I started advising startups, because like I never, you know, I never saw myself as a person that had much to contribute to other startups. I was like, you know, I didn't make millions of dollars with my, with my companies. Um, I had a lot of fun, learned a ton of stuff. I, you know, I've, you know, most of the things that I learned in the startup world, I got to carry in, into my, you know, into my day job. And it's made me very successful, you know, at, yeah, at my, my corporate, uh, uh role. Um, but you know, we're, we're doing, it really clicked in for me recently where I was, I was, I was on a, a call with, with one of my, um, uh, with, uh, the, 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 cheers guys and, uh, that one of their other advisors was on the call as well. You know, he's a, you know, super high level, very successful, you know, former VP of Amazon, you know, really, really accomplished pedigreed kind of a guy. And, um, you know, he introduced himself and was talking about all the stuff he worked on. And then I introduced myself and I was like, man, I, I feel like I'm not sure why I'm on this call. Um, but my first startup that I did was mobile ordering and payments. And he goes, well, don't, you know, the, the guy from Amazon said, you know, don't uh, cut yourself short because you have a half million dollar um, education in building this business and you know a lot of things not to do. And that's way more than they'd have on their own. So, uh, you know, don't sh cut yourself short. And I was like, you know, that's, that's true. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting, the stuff that, that once you've gotten into, you know, once you've done it a bunch of times, you get the reps in, right? Like things that seem like no brainer things to you now are new revelations to someone who might just be getting started on entrepreneurship. So uh, it, it's really interesting, you know, when I'm talking to especially young founders and I'm like, okay, so have you done X and Y and Z? They're like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing that I needed to do. Um, shoot, can you make me a list of like this kind of stuff? And at some point, like I, you know, it's funny you're talking about books. Like I'd like to write a book. I don't know if anyone would read, you know, I don't know if anyone would care what I have to say, but I'd love to write a book someday on uh, kind of like the, 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 the getting started, you know, in business kind of a thing. I mean, there's so many thousands of both books out there. Um, it feels like you'd be shouting into the hurricane with one, with another one, but uh, there's some really like, formative easy things that you can do to make sure that your business is prepared to fit to pitch you know venture capital funds and that you know if you if you needed to be acquired how would you be acquired um, that's something i went through with one of my portfolio companies uh last fall and they came to me and you know i helped them with their pitch a little bit um early on in the year and they were like well you know we're kind of having trouble getting traction i said well go look out maybe there's some companies out there that might be able to acquire you you know they, they built a really cool product they had it launched they had customers they had revenue uh, but just the, the, you know, in, in 2020 and 2021, the, the fundraising environment was just very difficult um, and they, they weren't going to survive and they were able to go out. They hustled like hell and they found a company to acquire them. Um, and it was great because they came to me um, once those conversations started up and they, they were like, OK, so um, they're asking us for due diligence uh, information. What, what, what is that? Like, what do we do? I'm like, OK, well, you need to put together a P&L. And they're like, OK, for, stop right there. What's a PNL? Um, so I was like, okay. So I was able to actually, you know, contribute a lot more than I thought, you know. And I was, for me, I was just happy to be along for the ride and happy to see these guys be successful. And that's, to me, that's the biggest, uh, you know, one of the biggest um, and most rewarding parts about advising startups is just seeing entrepreneurs grow and seeing companies grow and seeing what they do with their their passion and their ideas. It's really, really a fantastic part about working with entrepreneurs. It's just is just seeing all the cool things that they do. That's awesome. We are actually two minutes away um, from the show being over. Um, so I really want to switch gears. And, and, and this is something I ask. I, I know if you've listened to the show, it's, it's progressed as time's gone on. But I've asked a couple um, questions. or not. I don't know if it's asking questions. It's basically I ask, is there four, give four things or a few things that you think an uh, entrepreneur or startup would would benefit from for you specifically for you um what's a couple things that you as a startup when you were starting up what was things that you think that people could learn from their mistakes or or something they need to know in 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 doing a startup like something you feel is like advice for them i think uh it's a really good question um there's definitely some very foundational basic i don't know if it's it's not skill skill isn't really the right way to articulate it, it it's like a foundational Thing that you just have to be decent at and i don't know if it's yeah i mean sort of the definition of skill but like it's something a little bit different than a skill it's just something that you have to have to work on um entrepreneurs you need to have your financial house in order um if you are swimming in credit card debt and you are living paycheck to paycheck you're not going to be very successful as an entrepreneur you need to have the financial flexibility to be able to uh take time off of work and 
you know, imagine you you have a successful company that's growing quickly, but you have an emergency room visit or one of your kids has an emergency room visit and you just bankrupted yourself and your company because you were, you were bootstrapping your company. Like you got to have your financial house in order. Um, you need to be able to sell. You need to be able to sell not only yourself because if, if you're a, a, a high scale startup, you know, investors are investing in people. They're not investing in businesses at that stage. They're investing in people. So you need to be able to sell yourself and why you are the person to take this idea from, from zero to one. Um, but you also need to be able to sell your company. Like sales is, is a really, really um, often maligned part of business where people, when people think of the word sales and they, they, they think, oh, you know, I don't want to be a salesman. I don't want to try to sell things that people don't want need, but you got to flip that script because you're trying to sell something of value. You need to believe in the value of what your product brings to people. And if you don't believe in the value, no one else is going to believe in, in, in it either. So being able to articulate what it is that you do and how you make people's lives better, when you can show someone that their life is going to be better with your product, you don't have to sell it. Like they're going to come to you and ask to buy it. Like that's the great thing. Um, and then we talked about personal branding. That's an incredibly, incredibly important goal, uh, uh, thing that an entrepreneur just has to do. It's a practice. That, that's the word I'm looking for. It's practices. It's, it's financial stability, you know, being able to sell yourself as a practice and then being able to market yourself as, you know, with, with your, um, your personal brand is really, really, really important. And then I guess the, the third thing is, uh, or I guess the fourth thing would be networking. Um, you have to know, you have to be able to get to know people. You have to be able to provide value in relationships quickly and um, you got to be likable. I mean, there's a lot of people that, uh, uh, unfortunately, I feel like there's a lot of entrepreneurs out, out there that have gotten famous for being jerks, but um, I can tell you that those are much further and further, uh, much further in, uh, between than you would ever imagine because the people who are jerks don't, people don't like to help people who are jerks and people don't like to buy things from people who are jerks. Uh, so being nice and well-liked and being able to establish really uh, high quality relationships with people is a, another really important practice to get into. That's awesome, Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, I love those points. They were perfect. Like that was spot on. Like that's that's that that was spot on, dude. That was awesome, uh, Benjamin. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we are actually thirty two minutes into the show, uh, and that's should I do a thirty minute show? But I always I always enjoy running over. I got when, as much time when, as hey, you need if you if you hey, need more. when the content's good. No, look, when the content's good, it keeps flowing. But uh, I I sadly got to get off here because I got to get I got get dinner and ready and stuff. And but uh, dude, it's been great talking to you. I, I enjoyed having you on the show. Maybe if you're if you're willing to, we'll get you on the show again. If you have some more information you want to share. Definitely can schedule in for another call later in the later in the year. But uh, Benjamin, it was great getting to know you. Thanks for being on the show. Yep, yeah, sounds fantastic. So, so it was great meeting you, and uh, hopefully, you guys got um, you know, hopefully everybody listening got something really interesting out of it and, and learned something. Hopefully, definitely. And uh, for those uh, listening, uh, we know please stay safe out there. Enjoy, you know, the the, the year to come, and I uh, hope to hear in the next one.